Never have there been more kids online, often unaccompanied, than over the past few years. Tragically, that's led to some terrible new means for young people to be targeted and exploited by predators on now ubiquitous social media platforms. Late last year, for instance, hundreds of charges were laid in an investigation known as Project Maverick, conducted by 27 different police services across Ontario. With us now for more, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Leanna McDonald, Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. And back here in our studio, Detective Michael Savadin with the Toronto Police Service's Internet Child Exploitation Section, and Nora Constas, President and CEO at Boost Child and Youth Advocacy. Uh, very happy to have you two with us here in our studio. And Leanna McDonald, thanks for joining us from Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I gather it was a balmy minus 40 on the weekend. My goodness. Okay. Glad you did not freeze and glad you are with us. Let's start our conversation with uh, just some facts. Sheldon, can we have you bring up this graphic here? Cybertip.ca, which is Canada's national tip line for reporting the online sexual exploitation of children, saw a 106% increase in reports between the spring of 2020 and the spring of 2021. 106% increase. In 2021, the tip line processed a total of almost 21,000 reports. Ontario was the jurisdiction of origin for almost 6,000 of those reports, making it, not surprisingly, the province with the largest number of reports in Canada. Okay, Leanna, let's get to this. Why are we seeing increases in cyber crimes targeting youth in Ontario and across Canada, in your view? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons, uh, Steve. We're really in the perfect storm right now. Uh, when you look at the epidemic of COVID, kids spending more time online, um, isolated. Um, you also have access to platforms where we see adults having free access to children within those uh, environments. And also you have, you know, uh, child development. You have kids who are exploring um, their own sexuality. They're, you know, spending time online. And we have very sophisticated um, uh, networks of individuals who commit crimes against children. So basically, it, it really should not be a surprise to us. And then on top of it, uh, what we have is an unregulated internet. Hmm. All right, Nora, can I get you to follow up on the COVID angle? How much has COVID been responsible for the uptick that we've seen? I think COVID has complicated and increased the risk for a number of reasons. Before COVID, children had multiple um, outlets or opportunities to socialize. They had uh, friends that they could go out with and hang out with, but we had to put an end to that during COVID. And so children were isolated and quite literally left to their own devices, which resulted in them starting to, you know, experiment much more online and um, probably engage in riskier behavior without perhaps gaining a full appreciation for the potential consequences. So when you have inabilities to engage socially or in person, they're trying to maintain that social engagement or interaction online using different platforms. It's another un unhealthy byproduct of COVID that perhaps some people didn't consider. Yes, it is. Huh. Okay, Michael, uh, lots of terms here that we need some clarification around. For example, uh, the offense of self-exploitation. What is that? Yeah, so essentially self-exploitation is we are having kids as young as four years old. Uh, they are on their electronics and they're on certain social media platforms. And as Leanna said, sometimes it could be that they're exper or experimenting with themselves or they inadvertently post images or videos of themselves online. There are four-year-olds with their own iPhones? iPhones, their own accounts, their own email accounts. They are very knowledgeable and very advanced to what you would think a four-year-old would know about the internet and devices. Do you have any advice to parents on the advisability of getting their four-year-old an iPhone and an and a Instagram account to boot? I would not recommend it. And <laughs> those that do have access to devices, I would recommend uh, overseeing them uh, quite a bit. Okay, Leanna, another expression here, sextortion. What is that? Basically, it's blackmail. What we're seeing is kids who are being targeted, they're being coerced or tricked into um, giving a, a sexual image of themselves typically um, is what's happening or video. Uh, what we know is we've got very sophisticated organized crime networks that are making a lot of money 
in this capacity. And uh, we have kids who are completely being duped. They think they, a young boy might think they're talking to a pretty girl. And basically within a short time frame, they're um, you know, ex exchanging images. What happens very, very quickly is it, it turns to demands for money. And many of these organized groups are outside of North America. So it makes it incredibly complicated um, for law enforcement efforts. But more importantly, these kids don't stand a chance. And so um, it's really, really concerning. And since July alone, we've had 1,700 uh, reports come into us about sextortion. Oh, I got more on this. Hang on. Uh, we have uh, a lot more facts to introduce to the record here. Stats gathered by the Canadian Centre for Child Protection about the increase in youth being sextorted, as the term goes. Uh, these numbers gathered between July 2022 and January 2023, so six-month period. Cybertip.ca currently receives an average of 70 sextortion reports per week. The national tip line received more than 1,700 sextortion reports in total. 91% of sextortion victims are male. Typically, boys are extorted for money, girls are extorted for images. Sextortion demands for money often come from international organized criminal networks, as Leanna was telling us. 79% of sextortion incidents occurred on Instagram or Snapchat. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Nora, we need some advice here. If you find yourself the victim of a sextortion attempt, what do you do? I think the most important thing is ensuring that um, they have a, a trusted individual that they could speak to. And I think one of our biggest efforts is to really remove the shame and blame that's associated with making mistakes. These are children and youth who are, as Leanne mentioned, experimenting. And they're experimenting in areas, in non-traditional areas. And, and um, the internet being what it is and, and being unregulated, it creates a whole other level of risk. So I think what we need to do is really focus on providing caregivers, parents, teachers, the tools they need to be able to engage in these conversations, to be able to identify these situations and proactively engage with children and youth on some of the risks and dangers associated with and, it. And can we assume insulting your child or giving your child hell or something like that is not the way to go? It is absolutely not. The prohibitive approach um, actually creates more of a barrier and it really reduces the ability for the child to begin that trusting relationship with the adult. Michael, we mentioned off the top there were more than two dozen police services across Ontario that were involved in one particular operation. And uh, just curious, how, how do that many services work together, keep the thing under wraps so that it, the word doesn't get out and cooperate effectively to make arrests? Um, well, we have uh, what we call the provincial strategy and all the agencies work together to combat these offenses and identify and rescue children. Um, we all work very well together because we're very passionate about the job that we do. And it's just something that's been ongoing for many years and it grows and grows and hopefully we can get more agencies involved. Again, do, do police officers, I mean, this is very, very, I mean, this is just awful, right? This is disgraceful, this kind of thing. Yeah. Do police officers actually want to work in this field or would they prefer something else? I would say that uh, the majority of the officers that are in this field want to be in this field. I don't think it's a, it's a field that you could be in if you weren't invested into it. Um, as we were talking earlier today, I mean, that's one of the main questions. How do you do this job? And for me, I get to go to work every morning knowing that I have a chance to, to rescue a child. So that's, I think, what motivates all of us. Gotcha. Okay, let's follow up on that. And again, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, if you would, to bring up a graphic here outlining some more on what Michael uh, Savadin was just talking about. Project Maverick, conducted October 2022 as part of the provincial strategy just mentioned to protect children from sexual abuse and exploitation on the Internet. Ontario Provincial Police collaborated with 27 poli policing partners, including Toronto Police, to address these cyber crimes. In October of last year alone, Provincial strategy policing agencies identified 61 victims, conducted 255 investigations, executed 168 warrants, seized more than 1,000 electronic devices, arrested 107 people, laid 428 charges, safeguarded 60 children. Okay, Michael, how many investigations related to child abuse or exploitation did your squad conduct last year? 
Last year, we were roughly around uh, 2,000 occurrences for Toronto. And what was the after effect of all of that? The after effect is as far as uh, arrests and whatnot. Yeah. We had about 70 arrests, just over 70 arrests. And where are year. those arrests currently in the justice system pipeline? Um, that I couldn't tell you individually. Um, a lot of them are currently before the court still. Are some of the people who have been arrested in jail? Uh, there are some, yes. But most are not? There's a lot that have been released, yes. Do we infer from that they, they may be back to their nefarious activities? I can't speak about that. I mean, our, our job is to in conduct their investigations and put them before the courts and hope that uh, the courts do their job. Um, we have seen repeat offenders, of course. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. Mm. Um, but I hope that uh, the court process works and it doesn't happen. Nora, you work with Toronto Police, right? Yes, we Your do. organization does? Okay. Uh, what kind of supports uh, are you and they provided with? So one of the um, services that we provide at Boost is court support for children and youth who are victims of, of crime. Um, and the court support provides education right through the entire process from the beginning to, to even after the verdict has come down. So in the event of, um, of an acquittal, there are uh, conversations around um, how to best manage, uh, provide the children, youth, and the caregivers the supports they need to be able to move on from, from these traumas and incidents. Leanna, you were telling us earlier that uh, a lot of this is organized by international organizations operating on Canadian soil. Is there anything that can be done to protect children from these international influences? I'm really glad you asked that, Stephen. I, I did want to jump in on a couple of points. Sure. I think we really need to understand, in terms of the sextortion cases that we are seeing, uh, the level of depravity and seriousness of them. Um, we are having a number of kids who take their own lives, who die by suicide, because they're basically being terrorized within hours. Um, just around a year ago, we had a, a, a boy, a 17-year-old boy named Daniel Lentz, who took his own life. Um, I was on the phone with his mom last week and uh, talking to her and another mother whose son died by suicide and um, technology facilitated what unfolded is that these kids in many cases, they really are panicked and they don't stand a chance. So it's, it's within hours and we're talking a guerrilla like terrorism. These people are threatening their families. They're going to kill them. They're going to hurt, send out uh, the material to all of their contacts. It is really, really horrific. And so I think one of the messages from um, Daniel's mom uh, was like, you know, Leanna, this wasn't about me not being a good parent. Like, this wasn't about me not talking to my son about being safe online. And so I think it's really complicated because yes, of course, parents are going to be essential in an education and that front line of helping their children. But we also have to recognize that we've put children in a very compromised position where we can have organized crime networks actually targeting our Canadian children. And so this, there's a couple of things that uh, certainly we talk about. We talk about the need for sort of international joint efforts by the policing community. And I can, I'm happy to say that there is that going on, that we are sort of identifying these organized networks. Um, absolutely critical that there's an enforcement role there. We also know that parents have to be really vigilant in, in talking to the kids about the seriousness of these types of risks to them so that they know that what they might be experiencing isn't in fact true. So there's a lot of course things that we do need to arm parents with. But I also think that it's super um, necessary that again, this broader conversation about how is it that Canadian children can be targeted in this way. So we are certainly embracing the government of Canada's uh, steps forward to regulate the internet. We need to have that unfold right now. So these are the sorts of things that um, we're certainly promoting on our end. Okay, thanks, Leanne. I'll give you a second here to get your earpiece fixed there. And then, uh, Nora, let me follow up with you. I mean, I know a lot of parents who don't even have the passwords of their teenagers' cell phones uh, or iPhones. Uh, you know, how are parents supposed to have a positive influence on their kids' lives in this regard if, you know, if they don't even have that? So I think what you want to do is establish that trust. That is the most critical piece. Um, 
sometimes, you know, it's not going to start with the, the free flowing of information to say, here, ma'am, here's my password, please have your way with my phone. Um, it's also to remove some of the, and I, and I sort of touched on this earlier, remove that, that blame and shame. Um, have the conversations around, this is a real risk. This is, and there are very um, far reaching uh, consequences associated with it. But we need to have that dialogue. And we need to establish that trusting sort of bilateral reciprocal relationship to say, I'm here to support you, regardless of what's happened. And if it has happened, then we do need to report it because ultimately this is a crime. Hmm. Um, and children need to understand that. And that's going to be effective when there is consistent messaging from parents, from caregivers, from the school system, and perhaps even higher from government. Michael, I want to circle back to the Project Maverick uh, incident that we were talking about, the um, effort uh, undertaken by all of those different police services to um, make some headway against this. We did a program on last week uh, on the so-called, I guess what the federal conservatives are calling the catch and release bail system that they believe we have in this country right now. And I wonder, give us some insight here. How frustrated are cops when they do work, they arrest somebody, the person goes into the system, and two hours later, they're back out on the street. It is frustrating, but um, again, all that we can do is do the best investigations that we can and provide the best support we can for, for the victims of these crimes and then get it before the courts. And then from then it's up to the courts. I think it's important for the lawmakers and you know the persons in power that are speaking for our communities to be involved to further those discussions. Do you know whether, and, and again, I'm not taking a political position on this, I'm just inquiring here. If somebody does go before the court, they are arrested, they are released on their own recognizance or they get bail, they go out, are there any limitations, for example, placed on their internet use as part of the conditions of their bail? Again, that's a very general question. Um, generally, there, there is, but again, that's up to the courts to decide what the conditions are. Uh, that are placed on certain individuals. It's very fluid depending on the situation, depending on the person and whatnot. So again, once it gets to the court system, uh, we have very limited say into what happens there. Well, but if somebody's busted and they're released on their own recognizance and they're forced to whatever, stay home, stay off the internet, are you as a police officer allowed to kind of knock on their door and say, just, just inquiring, just checking to make sure you're not going online and creating more mischief? Generally not, no. Should you have that authority? Again, that would be something that I can't decide. You're being very careful yeah. here. I get it. Okay, okay. Uh, Nora, should the courts be tougher in granting bail to criminals who have been charged with sexual exploitation of youth on the internet? I think there needs to be greater understanding of the potential impacts on the lives of children and youth who are victims. Um, I think, you know, any verdict that comes out one way or the other will have implications. Um, and Leanna touched on it again, the risk of suicide and, and um, potential self-harm that goes with some of these outcomes is not an area that should go unnoticed or, or should go unrecognized. And one of the things we really do with, with our organization is provide these children and youth with the support systems and the tools they need to be able to move forward and become um, productive members of society and, and not and work through the trauma and everything that they've experienced as a result of but, this. Uh, just give me your gut instinct here. Do you think the justice system is adequately uh, seized of this issue in a way that will put the bad people away and give the young people a shot at coming back? I think the focus should be on uh, more of a multidisciplinary approach. So recognizing that it's not just the judicial system, that there is the education system that needs to come into play, that there is the healthcare system that needs to come into play. Um, and it's not just about one player. It's all of us actually coming to the table, dropping those silos and working together to ensure the best outcomes for these children and youth. Gotcha. Leanna, your organization's got something called Project Arachnid. What is that? So basically, Project Arachnid is a platform that allows our organization to detect known child sexual abuse material. What happens is when Project Arachnid comes across it, um, we issue automated notices to providers to have that material removed. And Steve, if you can believe it, we issue between 20 and 30,000 notices a day. 
20 to 30,000 a day. Okay, and how effective are the hosting companies and how quickly will they act, in other words, in a timely manner, to take this stuff down once you've identified it for them? Well, um, it all depends. So we have many of the um, providers who respond immediately when we send notices. And I think as we're getting sort of our sort of our, our strength in, in, in what Arachnid can do and our transparency in terms of our public reporting about who are the bad actors, who are the ones who are complying, it's making a significant difference. Today, we just had a piece out of the New York Times on Twitter and some of the delays we were seeing with notices and removal times, a very clear cut CSAM um, that needed to come down. So it really, really does depend. Um, but for the most part, we have that. The problem is, is we do have bad actors. And again, we run into jurisdictional challenges in terms of, of how companies have to respond. And I think that that it raises, you know, the larger question of the role of technology in the facilitation of child abuse. And let me just do one more follow-up here, which is to say, okay, you, you pointed out to a hosting company, they take the image down, what's to prevent the, the bad actors from, you know, uploading it again 15 minutes later? Excellent question. And so this is one of the biggest things that our organization is doing right now. Right now, there is no reason why companies should be uh, possessing or hosting any known child sexual abuse material. So Project Arachnid has a free sort of tool that allows companies to proactively stop the re-upload of child sexual abuse material. So the problem is, well, they don't have to use it. So as we're moving forward towards a regulatory framework, that is not only a question we're kind of raising to the Canadian government, companies should, they, sh they should have to use these types of tools, but internationally as well. There's no reason whatsoever that known images of child sexual abuse material should be on the clear internet. And I let you get away with using an acronym a moment ago, and I should have asked you what it stood for right away. You said CSAM, which stands for child, what? Sorry, child sexual abuse material. There we go. Or under can Canadian law, child pornography, but we do not use the term. Gotcha. Uh, okay, Michael, back to you. The dark web which I don't even know how to use. I'm sure you guys do. I don't know how you find it, but anyway, I hear about it all the time. Yeah. How influential is it in all of this activity? Um, we are aware of it. Uh, obviously, it is a part of what we do, but even more alarming is what is on the ClearNet, the availability and the access to uh, materials and children on the ClearNet. So uh, the dark web, we are aware of it, it's available, but it's even more alarming what's happening right in front of us in the ClearNet. I, okay, let me do a quick follow on this. Does everybody know how to find the dark web and I'm just an idiot or what's the story here? Um, I don't think everybody knows how to find it, no. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting you give people advice on how to find it, but is it, is it ubiquitous? Um, no, if you know where you're looking, it can be pretty easy to, to get a hold of. Should I just leave this alone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave this alone. Okay, um, Leanna, back to you. The feds are apparently working on a bill right now tackling online harmful content. Last spring, I think you served on an advisory panel of experts to help guide what should and should not be included in that bill. And one of the topics that you were tasked with sort of tackling is whether this bill uh, should be able to force services to remove harmful content. Um, when it comes specifically to child sexual exploitation content, do you think there is a consensus among experts on how to proceed? Oh, that was my sense. I mean, when you're talking to a group of, of experts about the significant harm tied to child sexual abuse material and what that does, uh, both for the survivor and for the society at large, everybody was very clear about that. I think where the challenges lie for us is there's a number of other pieces of material that we would call as very harmful that ought to be included. So we will see, and again, a bit graphic, I'll be careful here, but we would see pictures of children Children being violently physically abused. So of course we know that's a criminal offense, but the recording of it occurs. That recording then ends up online and you'll see toddlers being beat up. Um, those, those videos and those images should not be allowed to be reviewed over and over and over again. We'll see pictures of kids being um, tied up. Um, those are not the types of material 
um, that should be allowed online. So the problem is with removal is typically we are using the threshold of criminal law. And certainly we need criminal law to put bad people in jail, but we don't need criminal law as the threshold for removal. So right now, when we look at, well, how does this work? Really, the industry has the keys. It's their moderators who actually get to decide what goes up and what comes down. So our organization has put together sort of a blueprint that maps out the types of harms that we are seeing where you see children's faces completely visible and some wrong is being done to them and they have no privacy rights, they have no protection. And over and over again, this material just goes around the internet. So we're putting sort of a, a, a very, we're taking a very strong stance on that with clear cut examples of how governments, not only in Canada, but around the world, absolutely need to do more for children. Have the feds told you when we're gonna see a bill? No. So stand by is the advice at the moment. Yes. Got it, okay. Nora, what do you hope to see uh, if and when this bill comes forward? I think one of the most important things is recognition of what harmful material is. And as Leanna mentioned, it's it's not just uh, the pornographic images, and it, it is the um, the full exposure and, and the, the, the privacy challenges that these children face. They are exposed completely, their faces, parts of their bodies. It, it becomes so important that um, social media or companies uh, recognize that it's not just about uh, a crime being committed, it's about the potential implications long-term for that child, youth, and or family. Can I ask you the bigger overarching question here, which is, I mean, all of what you're engaged in right now, all three of you, is, is trying to stop something that's basically already happened. And, and presumably, this stuff would not be created in the amount that it is if there weren't a market or a demand for it in the first place. Have you got any thoughts about how we stop or, or reduce the demand for this kind of material to begin with? I think, you know, there's, there's bad people out there and you can't change that. It, the, I think what we can change is really taking a much more proactive approach in teaching our children and youth about what is um, right and what is wrong and what are some of the risks. I think we've got a generation um, who thought that because it's all online or because it's, it's behind a camera and it's sent to one person, that it doesn't have the potential to go viral um, or it doesn't have the potential to be leaked elsewhere. It's really providing them the education they need to be able to understand what are some of the potential consequences of those actions. Michael, can you follow up on that? People watching this right now or listening to it would certainly want want some advice from law enforcement on how not to be victimized by this kind of thing? What would you say? Yeah, I, I would say much as what Nora and uh, we were talking about earlier is open communication with your children. Be that trusted parent that they can come to um, from an early age, have limitations and guidelines into using electronics and the internet, um, restricting access in certain areas such as kids taking their devices to the bathroom where they're going to be alone and, and on them speaking to who knows who, and again, to add to the, the problem of um, stopping this from happening, I think one of the biggest things is access. We've got to prevent and slow down the access of this. I could go on to an application right now and I could probably find some CSAM for you. It's that easy. So if it's that easy for, for me, uh, these kids are on these applications all day and all every day, right? It's, it's just we've got to stop the access, especially for the kids that are getting into it nowadays. How hard is that to do? I think it's pretty hard. Pretty difficult. Nowadays, yeah. Hmm. Okay, Leanna, can I get you to weigh in on that as well? Oh, you sure can. I mean, I think that this is, there's a couple of major things that are really, really important to talk about. Um, the role of technology and in facilitating the propagation of this material has created a nightmare. Um, so the fact, like I, we were talking about earlier, that this should not even be allowed to be on the internet. So we really need to move towards regulation and we need to make sure that companies must do everything they're told to stop this from happening, to prevent the re-victimization of these survivors and victims. I think the normalization and the commodification of children as sexual objects has become a significant problem online. We see the communication in the dark web daily. I can go on uh, the dark web right now and find communication all about 
um, individuals' problematic sexual interest in children. So what we're doing is, is we're creating an environment where we're normalizing such behavior. And those people who might, you know, need some help are starting to um, connect with others, communities who are normalizing this type of material. I also think it's really important that we kind of look at, you know, very young children who are being sexually abused by someone they know. That is being recorded and distributed online. That has nothing to do with internet safety. Of course, it has to do with schools engagement and different types of personal safety education. But we have we have one problem. And then we have, again, kids, teens experimenting where they are, again, being teenagers. Um, they, you know, make, let's say, an error in judgment or somebody um, sort of mis abuses that trust and we end up with a whole different set of problems so it really is um sort of a very unfair place that we've positioned children because they really don't have any rights and so we are kind of stuck in the spot right now until we figure out a couple of foundational flaws here that we have tied to technology we're going to continue to have kids being victimized kids cannot compete with adults and so we really need to take a hard look as to what are the remedies we can put in place today to stop victims of tomorrow understood uh, I want to thank the three of you for coming into TVO tonight and joining us from Winnipeg, Manitoba, as Leanna McDonald from the Canadian Centre for Child Protection has, and sharing your insights. Uh, Leanna out of town, Nora Constas from uh, Boost Child and Youth Advocacy, and Michael Sabadam, Detective with Toronto Police Services Internet Child Exploitation Section. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge with us here tonight on TVO. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.